Technology here at Aarhus University, uh, and I'm on the fifth semester. And I've really been looking forward to this event. Uh, in the spring, I was actually listening to several of uh, Mike's debates, debates on YouTube, uh, and I really like that. Uh, and Casper, he is actually one of my own teachers here at Aarhus University. And from having heard a lot from both these men, I can definitely tell that we have two very competent people here to debate uh, this topic, uh, whether the Gospels are reliable accounts of Jesus. And today this event is uh, organized by Veritas Forum and KFS. And the Veritas Forum, we are an organization that wants to invite students or whoever is interested uh, in coming and um, investigating and engaging in some of the biggest and hardest questions here in life. And it is from like a Christian platform, but still everyone is welcome. And it's not just about delivering like a certain truth, but in, in verses we are, yeah, we want to have like a dialogue and a, a debate uh, so that we together can see the truth. And KFS, it stands for Kreskid Forbund for Studerende, and it's a Christian student organization that is also here at the Aarhus University. And uh, Confess is like meeting in different groups, uh, uh, also here every every Thursday at Stockton. I'll tell you more about that later. But in Confess, um, we also want to talk about the bigger questions in life. We talk a lot about belief, and we see that from both a personal uh, perspective, but also from a more academic perspective. And the program for today is that we'll have two different rounds. Here in the first round, Mike and Casper, they will have 20 minutes each to, pre to present uh, their um, views, uh, yeah, the most simple views. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then after that we'll have a break for 10 minutes where you can just refill your coffee cup. And after that, there will be a Q&A session for like 45 minutes, and then we are done by 4 o'clock. And now I'll pass on the microphone to another, Amy, who will be the moderator for today. And just let, let's give these two guys a hand before we... My name is also Emil, and I've been part of the, the team who has organized this event. I'll be a moderator of the event, uh, and uh, well, I'm a, I'm a PhD student, not in Biblical Studies, but in system, uh, Systematic Theology in Oslo. Uh, yeah, so I've been looking very much forward to having Mike and Casper here uh, in a discussion on these questions of, uh, of the reliability of the Gospels as uh, a source to who Jesus was. And I want to thank you for both for uh, agreeing to uh, you, Mike, for coming from the, the US to uh, Denmark, and you have been to Sweden also, so to Scandinavia, and to you, Casper, for uh, yeah, for wanting to be part of this event and give, so we can have different perspectives. So we just don't, so it's not only Mike's perspective we give. Okay, well, I will start with giving a presentation of our two speakers, Casper. Well, I'm probably one of the, the least qualified person to present you since, uh, since uh, many people here probably has had you as a teacher, but I've been Googling uh, around a bit. <laughs> and I know you are Associate Professor in Biblical Studies at the School of Culture and Society. You, uh, you, you did your PhD here in August in 2006, and then you rewrote it and published in 2008 as Recognizing the Stranger. Recognition Scenes in the Gospels of John. And then in 2015, you published, a, you were a editor of another book, uh, The Gospel of John as Genre Mosaic. And I see like a pattern that like the Gospel of John is kind of like a red thread through your academic work. But you, you have also uh, published papers on the other Gospels and other biblical passages, wisdom literature, early Christianity, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. You have also uh, written popular articles uh, about Jesus and the New Testament uh, for Danish newspapers like Politiken, Weekendavisen, Jyllandsposten, and of course, Christi Dagbladet. 
and then your newest uh, popular uh, publication is uh, in the series from also University Tinkerpauser, which translates something like Pause for Thoughts, and that book is on Jesus. Yes, and you might do an associate professor of theology at Houston Baptist University. Uh, you did your PhD in uh, New Testament studies at the University of Pretoria in 2009. And then uh, you published uh, uh, a, a book on the resurrection of Jesus in 2010. And I think maybe that was the topic of your dissertation, right? Yeah. Uh, and that has kind of been the, the red lines through your academic work, uh, the question of the, the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You have also engaged in many debates on this topic, uh, most notable with uh, Bart Ehrman, whom you have debated several times in the question of the, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and then in 2016, you published a book called Why are, the Dif Why are There Differences in the Gospels? What we can learn from ancient biography, which is uh, like about biblical contradictions and what the genre, uh, what genre can teach us about that. And that is kind of also the topic for this event, uh, uh, about how how the Gospels are sources to the life of Jesus. Yes, but uh, now I have spoken enough, so I will give the word to you, and I think we'll begin with you, Casper. Yeah. So you will give your yeah, opening remark. Good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, as you heard, uh, I, uh, in my research I normally focus on the Gospel of John, which I think is the least reliable of the Gospels uh, in the New Testament. So reliability and historicity is not something that I really uh, work very much on. But I have been challenged by you, Emil, to discuss this and I'm very happy to do that. Um, I under understand that my role is the devil's advocate here, <laughs> uh, and I shall do my best, uh, but uh, let's see, uh, I hope we can have some discussion. Uh, the, the first things, thing I would like to say is uh, that the question here, what about the question? Are the Gospels historically reliable accounts of Jesus? Well, I, I would say yes and no. So. Uh, that's the first boring answer to the question. And it depends, of course, on how much reliability do you want to have. Uh, we can discuss that later on. But the question, uh, are the Gospels historically reliable accounts of Jesus, are very modern questions, I think. They are questions that came up, uh, have come up since the Enlightenment, since the middle of the 1700s, when biblical scholarship became to be inspired by things that happened in historical scholarship, namely the question, what, re what did really happen? What did really happen? Wie es eigentlich gewesen, as the Germans said. <laughs> so biblical scholarship became a historical critical scholarship, which doesn't mean uh, that it's very critical in the sense that it's overcritical. It just means that you want to investigate the question how historically reliable are the texts? And the question also, it's a modern question, but it also presupposes a possible distinction between on the one hand a historical Jesus and on the other hand an image of Jesus in the Gospels, uh, the Jesus image that we sometimes call the proclaimed Christ. So the question presupposes a possible distinction between a historical Jesus and a proclaimed Christ in the Gospels, uh, which was not there before uh, 1750 or something like that. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. 
It's a good historical question. How historically reliable are some texts? Uh, but the question has also often met criticism. Uh, historical Jesus research since the middle of the 1700s hundreds, have all, very often come up with a Jesus image. Uh, Jesus always was a good guy. Uh, when you did Jesus research, the image of Jesus you found was a good guy, and he was a good guy according to the values of the Jesus scholar. So you were not, you couldn't say you were looking into a mirror as a Jesus scholar, but uh, tell me who you think Jesus were, and I shall tell you what your main values are. You could say that to most uh, historical Jesus scholars, I think. So there's a good reason to criticize the whole project of looking at the historical Jesus. Uh, this was done in a huge volume around 1910 by Edward Schweitzer, great theologian, but he was also a, a doctor who went to Africa and made a hospital, came home, got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, played a lot uh, on the organ, back on the organ, made concerts, got money for his hospital again. He was a, a huge person, personality, but he was also a biblical studies guy and he was one of the great uh, critics of the endeavor uh, looking for the historical Jesus, though he did try it himself. So uh, tell me who you think Jesus were and I'll tell you what your main values are. Uh, in the 1800s uh, of cultural optimism, the historical Jesus was an eth ethical character, ethical teacher. Around 1900 in the fin de siècle, uh, uh, period, Jesus became an eschatological teacher of the end of the world as we know it. In the 1960s and 70s, historical Jesus scholars saw Jesus as a kind of proto-communist. And in the postmodern 1980s, Jesus was an anti-metaphysical deconstructivist of some sort. <laughs> so, uh, Jesus changes according to uh, the milieu of the scholars. For this reason, there are historical Jesus optimists and there are historical Jesus pessimists. And I consider myself as a moderate pessimist. Now, what do I mean, mean by that? Um, an optimist is someone who really thinks that we can find out a lot about the historical Jesus by looking deeply and critically into the Gospels. One example would be the Jesus Seminar in the 1980s and 90s in the US who published a version of the Gospels with print in different colors. So you, you had a red color, which meant this was said by the historical Jesus, a pink color, this was maybe said by the historical Jesus, a gray color, this was probably not said by the historical Jesus, and black, this was certainly not the historical Jesus. So people were, were very optimistic about how uh, far you can go with historical scholarship. Uh, pessimists, on the other hand, would say that our sources are too far in time from Jesus and too far, far from his context to even answer the question. Jesus was uh, working in the 30s uh, CE. The Gospels were written from 70 CE on, that is uh, four decades later or even later. Jesus spoke Aramaic. The Gospel writers wrote in Greek. So, pessimists would say we are too far away from the events to really be able to make a good picture of the historical Jesus. This could also, of course, be said from theological reasons. If you, if you cannot make a picture of the historical Jesus, he, he is not able to challenge your Christian faith or challenge the church. So, it could also be argued, you can also be a pessimist from the, for theological reasons and not only for historical reasons. So, I call myself a moderate pessimist. That means I think that, in fact, you can collect some information that you can argue with some probability, here are the Gospels uh, historically re reliable. But I don't believe that we can go into details and say, this and that saying by Jesus was said in this and that form by that historical Jesus. I'm not that optimistic on behalf of historical research. So let me try to give you some examples of what I think that, uh, that is historically re reliable in the Gospels. Uh, 
First, Jesus did exist. He is a historical person. Uh, we have yeah, we have different independent sources mentioning him, and we have external sources, Tacitus uh, and Josephus mentioning him. So uh, sources are actually quite good relating to the, the, the pure existence of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, in spite of not coming from the aristocracy, is one of the best attested uh, Palestinian Jews from the first century. I also think that Jesus was in some sense connected to John the Baptist. That he was, maybe he was a disciple of John the Baptist who went solo and made his own uh, movement, maybe took some of the, the John the Baptist disciples with him, like a guy who, who is in the company and starts on his own and take the best ones with him. Um, and wh why do I believe that? Well, we also, we of course need, need some criteria here. We want to look at the early sources, on, at independent sources that give the same data. With external sources are of course good because they don't have the same uh, interest in, in what's going on. And then also the criterion of embarrassment, which I, I, I quite like, which is uh, things in the Gospels that are not that are embarrassing to the Gospel writers are more probable to be historical th than things that fit into their ideology uh, very well. And we can see from the Gospels that the, the, the Gospel writers are not very happy to, to, to uh, show that Jesus is dependent on John the Baptist. There are lots of excuses going on in the text. So that's the reason why I think that it's actually historical that Jesus was with John the Baptist. Jesus was an, a healer or an exorcist. I also think that is reliable. Uh, the Gospels talk about it independently. Uh, it's a huge part of the Jesus tradition. I cannot go into all the arguments. I just I want to show you some points here. Jesus was a religious freelancer of some sort. Uh, not a part of the, the established uh, Jewish authorities, and he was a great story, storyteller. His teaching was uh, often in parables. We can see that from the independent gospel traditions and even in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is a, a great storyteller. And uh, the a final thing that I think is probably reliable more things can be historically true, but I'm only mentioning what I can think that can be, be argued as probable. Probable is the, the final thing is that Jesus was crucified by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate in the 30s CE. That we know from Tacit Tacitus, and we know it from the Gospels, and it's certainly an embarrassing thing to them. If Jesus was the Messiah, it's not a good story that Jesus was crucified. The, the, one of the greatest uh, murder or crime mysteries of all time in history is, well, why did Pontius Pilate crucify Jesus? And now, uh, as a moderate pessimist, as I said, I was, uh, I, I don't want to move too much into that. But I'm aware that there are basically two, uh, or maybe three, uh, explanations. The Gospels themselves say that it's part of God's plan to save humankind. Of course, we cannot deal with that from a historical point of view. But uh, uh, but the two the, the the two other explanations would be that Jesus was a kind of zealot. He was a political um, um, a a, a political uh, um, uh, revolutionary, uh, and you could argue from some elements in the gospel narratives. Uh, uh, Jesus' disciples have weapons, apparently, when Jesus is caught. Uh, you could go into other details. Uh, but since they don't crucify all Jesus' uh, Jesus's, uh, followers, but only Jesus, it seems to me that he was not a sealer, but he was rather a kind of, and this is the third explanation for why Pilate uh, crucified Jesus, he was rather a kind of prophetical temple critic uh, and Pilate uh, saw it fit to crucify Jesus so that he would not, uh, he would not uh, make too much uh, disturbance and inner Jewish uh, conflicts uh, in Jerusalem.
So these are things that I think uh, are probably, uh, probably reliable in the Gospels. What is not reliable? Well, I also have some points here. For the first, uh, the first one is I don't think Jesus was uh, born in Bethlehem. Paul doesn't uh, say anything about it. Mark doesn't say anything about it, about it. Mark says that Jesus was from Nazareth. I think that the story about Jesus born in Bethlehem is something that comes out of the embarrassment uh, that Jesus is is a uh, is a is is not from the city of David, but comes up north from uh, what we would call uh, the the, uh, the the rotten falafel, maybe uh, uh, in in northern Galilee. Uh, what, second thing that is not reliable, Jesus did not walk on water, he did not raise the dead, and he did not resurrect from the dead, it's as seen from a historian's point of view. Historical scholarship builds on a naturalist <laughs> worldview, and uh, of course there could be very early rumors about Jesus uh, walking on water and Jesus raising from the dead, but, uh, but from a historical point of view we, we cannot say that he did so because things like that do not happen in the world that is studied by historical scholarship. Jesus uh, did not say that Christ believers should abandon Jewish food laws. I think that Jesus was a, a, Jews from, uh, a Jew from Palestine, and uh, when Jesus, in for example, uh, Mark 7, says uh, that you should uh, stop following Jewish food laws, and. Uh, uh, kosher food doesn't matter at all. I think that is a later Christian uh, interpolation, as it were. It reflects a later Christian situation where Christianity has become a uh, mainly a non-Jewish uh, movement. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense, sense to me that Jesus in a Jewish context would say so. He may have been a liberal in some sense uh, regarding to how you interpret uh, the laws, but not that liberal. Um, Jesus didn't say that all the disciples should go and on a mission to all peoples, as he says in Matthew 28, and we say at, in the context of the baptism in the Danish people's church uh, every Sunday. Because uh, in other places in Matthew, Jesus says that, the, that he is only for, for Israel, and later on in the Jesus movement, around the year, the year 50, there's a great discussion, should we include non-Jews or not? If Jesus had said, let's include non-Jews, let's include any, everybody, then why did they have this big discussion? I think this, uh, we are to thank, uh, not Jesus for this idea, but Paul for this idea, or at least for Paul for, for being the one who spread this idea that the message of Jesus is not only for Jews. Finally, I don't think that Jesus said that he was one with God and he was God's only son sent from heaven. He says so in the Gospel of John, in 1030, for example, I and the Father are one. But he does not say so in the early in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, I think that is also a, a later Christian interpolation in the sense that uh, the belief in Jesus as the only Son of God sent from heaven uh, was laid in the mouth of Jesus in the later Gospels. Doesn't mean that Jesus couldn't have seen him, himself as in a spe special relation to God in some sense, or even as the Messiah, but not as the uh, only begotten Son of God. How much time do I have left? Five minutes, that's very kind. So why do the Gospels contain a mix of history and Christ, early Christian fan fiction, if I may? Why do, why, why do we have this mix? I think the Gospels were not written uh, with the same purpose as uh, modern historians would write a, a piece of, of, of histor historical writing. Sure, they were written to recount the story about Jesus. Luke says so in his uh, introduction to his Gospel. But they were certainly also written in order uh, to be preaching, to be a kind of propaganda, if you were, uh, for Christian belief. As John says at the end of his gospel, this is written uh, so that you may believe. 
So the Gospels were written to make Jesus relevant in new cultural contexts. And as the context changed, the Jesus story also changed. The Gospels were a kind of cultural memory in, in the early Christ movement. Uh, we, uh, cultural memory is something that is started in the humanities uh, with theor theorists like uh, Alaida and Jan Asman. And they say that in cultural memory, when a group starts to establish its common cultural memory, a process goes on, a process of forgetting and remembering. Lots of things are forgotten and other things are, are picked out to be uh, remembered. And in this process, it is not the past that is the most important thing, it's the present. It's the things that can be used in the present that are most important. Jesus probably did lots of things that are forgotten because they weren't relevant to early Christians like John, Mark, uh, Luke and, and, uh, and uh, Matthew. Uh, so, uh, the, the Gospels were written to create a cohesion in the early Christ movement. Uh, the Gospels were the matador of early Christians. Mm -hmm. Matador is a local reference. Matador is a TV series that in, I believe in Denmark has become a, more or less uh, our cultural memory in the sense that this is where it's a series that we see again and again. Everybody knows it and it tells the story about how we as modern Danes came out of a uh, conservative culture, a crisis in the 20s or, and 30s, uh, the Second World War. But it's uh, a story that uh, is very much created from a, a contemporary point of view, from a post-1968 point of view, I would say. It looks at, at previous times in order that we can celebrate that we are no longer in that world. We look at how gender equality was not something that you had before 1968, but we and and thus we celebrate that we have it more in, in, in a, to a greater extent today. And in the story, we have Elisabeth Fries, who is the identi identifying character to us. She's the one fighting for gender equality. She's the modern person in the old world that we can identify with. And Jesus. He is the Elizabeth Fries of the Gospels. <laughs> he is the one that early Christians could identify with, though he did say some things in the Gospels that he didn't say historically, um, because he was being made relevant in a new context. And the Gospel thus developed uh, in a process that looks very much uh, like uh, what we call rewritten scripture in early Judaism. In early Judaism, there was a, certainly an idea of sacred scripture, but it that didn't mean that you can't, couldn't touch it and you couldn't change it. So lots of writings appeared in early Judaism inspired by, maybe sometimes even from just a small sentence in, in what we call the Old Testament. Uh, there was a sentence saying that Joseph, uh, Joseph who became uh, a rich man in Egypt, you know the story? Uh, that Joseph was married to an Egyptian girl called Asenath. Only one sentence in, in Genesis. Uh, and then early Jews created a whole novel. How did they meet? How did they get married? How did Asenath become converted into a Jew? Uh, so lots of stories going on where you retell and rewrite and remold sacred tradition. As if you were thinking, the sacred stories are fantastic, let's make some more of them. And uh, this, this attitude seems also to have been there in, in the, the gospel tradition as, as, a, as a Jewish tradition, that you could also change the gospels in order to make them relevant in new contexts. And thus, uh, well, in Mark, uh, the, the last words of Jesus, the famous last, last words are, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, in, in antiquity, th this was called Ultima verba, the final words and the most important words. You needed to have them in a good biography uh, in order to show who is the main character. And this is what Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark at the end. Maybe Mark wants to show us that Jesus really was the suffering Messiah, not a, a Davidic uh, war, warrior Messiah. 
But Luke and John apparently doesn't, doesn't want to go with that. They change the final words of Jesus. And Luke changes it into, Father, in your uh, hand I, I commit my spirit. According to Luke, Jesus could not say so as his last words. My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? So uh, Luke has a more uh, an understanding of Jesus as a kind of, uh, of a stoic philosopher who, who dies in peace and thus he has to say something else. He says, uh, in, into, into your hands I commit my spirit. And John, what, what, is the, what are the last words of Jesus there? It is finished. It's a, it's a, cry, of, it's a cry of victory, not of, of defeat as in Mark. And I think it's because John has a different Christology, a different understanding of Jesus. Jesus is always in control in the Gospel of John. You shouldn't, you shouldn't doubt that he can save you. He is a superman, but there's no kryptonite. He cannot be touched. And Jesus uh, cries his victory uh, even on the cross. Uh, Easter Day and uh, Good Friday are the same day in the Gospel of John. So uh, Jesus becomes relevant in ever new contexts. And uh, my last uh, uh, question that I would like to answer would be, is the question at all interesting? Is it important? Is it theologically important? Are the Gospels historically reliable accounts uh, of Jesus? But I think I will turn that question into a cliffhanger. We can discuss that later on. Because I think that's also important to think about. Is this a theologically important question, whether the, the Gospels are reliable or not? Um, we have the question, it's historically interesting, but is it theologically interesting and important? Um, discussing this afternoon is, are the Gospels historically reliable? And I think to get started, it's important to define what we mean by the term historically reliable. Um, the ancients wrote uh, with different objectives than we moderns do when they were reporting history. Usually when they're writing a history or a biography, say they're writing a history like Tacitus or Cassius Dio or uh, any, any of the other great uh, Roman historians or even uh, Thucydides in the history of the Peloponnesian War, a lot of them are writing for specific purposes. Uh, for example, maybe they're writing to discuss uh, the greatness of Rome and they want the readers to be um, uh, very proud of being Roman citizens. So they will talk about these things and frame the story in such a way um, that the Roman citizen can rejoice in this. Or like Tacitus, he is, uh, for the most part, he's becoming very disenchanted with the way uh, morality is going with, as things have transferred or transitioning from republic to empire. And so you see this as one of his emphases throughout uh, his Annals of Rome. Biographies, according to Plutarch, who is regarded as the greatest uh, biographer of antiquity, in the first chapter of his life of Alexander, he talks about how he's writing biography and that differs from history insofar as he is painting a literary portrait of his main character. And in doing so, he's only going to report those events and teachings of the person that illuminates that person's character, who that person is. So, and I think that's important as we study the Gospels to understand what they are, are doing and as we understand and uh, approach other biographies uh, written in that period. Now, because they're doing these things, just like historians today, um, uh, or us in our conversations, daily conversations, they're going to take some liberties or flexibilities in the way they report things. So they're going to do things like compress stories as though they occurred over a shorter period of time and 
than they had act in which they had actually occurred. Um, they may transfer what one person said to the lips of, the, of another in order to simplify the story. They may displace an, an event from its original chronological context and transplant it in another one in order to simplify the story or draw attention more to something else. So these things happen. They may have happened in different contexts, but they connect them together in order to make a point or, or for emphasis. They're going to take a little more liberties in the way that they report events than we might feel comfortable doing today. Um, but historians, for the most part, and biographers, they would adapt, they would edit, but they didn't typically invent. They might take a speech and invent a speech, but for the most part, it was a speech that was given, that was actually given by that person on that occasion, and maybe they had no reports of what that person had said, so according to Polybius, uh, Thucydides, Lucian of Samosata, you would, re you would report what that person probably said on that occasion if you didn't have any reports. But you weren't allowed to just go ahead and invent scenes and uh, invent events that never occurred. That was not proper history or biographical writing. So we can... When we define what we mean by historically reliable, I think it's important to understand that uh, we, we must take into consideration the literary conventions that were in play at the time of writing, rather than forcing our idea of modern precision upon them. And when we do that, I think a reasonable definition for historical reliability as applied to the Gospels or any ancient literature would be that that ancient literature would have to preserve an accurate gist or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. So that's what I'm speaking of when I speak of historical reliability. Another point I can make with this is there are two ways of speaking of reliability, specific and general. Now, most of us are going to have a preferred news agency. Um, now, in the United States, most of our news agencies are on the political left. We have one news agency on the political right. So Americans who have leanings to the political left are going to watch a news agency from that uh, perspective, maybe CNN or ABC or one of those. If they have political leanings to the right, they're going to watch Fox News. All right. Now, whichever one that American watch or whichever one you watch here in Denmark, um, you could assess a specific story and say that specific story that they're giving is true or false or mostly true or mostly false. Or you could say, broadly speaking, um, I know that that specific network agency, uh, despite their biases, um, they are, they have, they're going to be select in what they give me. All right, they're only going to give me what they want me to hear. And they're going to give me the story as they want me to hear it. So it's going to have their biases on it. I'm only going to get what they want me to hear. So it's a very biased uh, news that I'm getting. And some of it's false, some of it's true. But generally speaking, of all the networks or news agencies, this one is, broadly speaking, reliable. So when we come to ancient literature, like the Gospels or Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars or Plutarch's Lives, Tacitus's Annals of Rome, or his life of uh, Agricola, his father-in-law, we can look at things in specific stories, which scholars do. Same thing with the Gospels, historical Jesus research. Uh, Casper mentioned a few of those things that he believes occurred, and uh, uh, everything that he said in terms of what he thinks are true in the Gospels, and say a, a, a universal consensus of scholars would agree with him on that. Um, nearly 100%, actually. Um, and then, you know, so we can look at those things specifically, or we can view things broadly speaking. Uh, is Tacitus' the Annals of Rome historically reliable? Um, is Suetonius' Life of Augustus reliable? Is the Gospel of Mark reliable? Is the Gospel of John reliable? Okay. Now, when we come to Suetonius' Lives of the Caesars, there's 12 of them, and they vary in their reliability like his life of Caesar, his life of Augustus, are far more reliable than some of the others. He's using better sources. He's more interested in those. When you come to the others, they're not so interesting. They're, he wasn't so interested, so he just kind of does them quickly. 
When we come to the Gospels, they're different Gospels. They're writing with different perspectives. I would not agree with Casper that the Gospel of John is the least reliable of the Gospels, um, depending on how he's defining reliable. Um, I would also say that I would agree if what he's saying is if we are reading Jesus' exact words, then the way John reports Jesus' words are probably uh, further away from the actual words Jesus used than what we find in Mark. Okay? Uh, even uh, conservative uh, Johannine scholars like a Paul Anderson, a Ben Witherington, a Craig Keener, they would all admit that what we have, or uh, Craig Lomberg, they would all admit that John is a theological paraphrase, that John is probably taking Jesus' teachings and he's expanding them to bring up the theological significance and recasting them in Johannine idiom in his own words. And so, yes, we have uh, some other stuff that's going on in John, and John can be difficult to understand. Uh, I don't claim to understand what's going on all in John's gospel, and in fact, uh, the prominent conservative New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says the Gospel of John, he, he thinks of John as he thinks of his wife. He loves her, but he doesn't claim to understand her. <laughs> <laughs> so with this in mind, um, I want to, thinking of historical reliability in terms of the Gospels, uh, broadly speaking, and um, defining historically reliable as uh, if presents an accurate gist or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred as a minimum standard. Doesn't mean they couldn't go beyond that, but I'm applying this to all ancient biographies and his historiography. So I want to present four, uh, propose four criteria for assessing historical reliability and speak of the Gospels in this way. The first criterion is that the author chose the sources judiciously. In other words, the author used good judgment in their choice of sources. And uh, I'm going to focus, uh, since Casper mentioned Mark, I'll, I'll focus on Mark. So the early tradition that we have on the Gospel of Mark comes from a guy named Papias, who wrote sometime in the first half of the second century. We have multiple early church fathers who talk about Papias. Papias reports sometime in the early second century that he was listening to one of the associates of Jesus' disciples. So one of Jesus' actual disciples, um, one who had traveled with Jesus, could have been John the son of Zebedee, or could have been a minor disciple called John the Elder. There's actually a dispute on what Papias meant here. Um, but it was one of Jesus' actual disciples, an eyewitness, and someone who had traveled with that disciple, an associate of that disciple. Papias says that associate told him that he learned from that disciple that Mark wrote down what uh, Jesus had said, or he, Mark wrote down what he remembered Peter telling him. And he said he, he learned this from that associate while that disciple was still alive and teaching. So that almost certainly puts this report in the first century. Papias may have reported it sometime in the second century, but Papias learned this in the first century. So think about this for a moment. Papias talked to someone who had traveled with, who was an associate of one of Jesus' personal disciples. And that disciple told him that Mark wrote down what he remembered Peter saying. That's remarkable. To have that source, there's other reasons to believe that Mark is writing what Peter uh, had told, had he remembered Peter saying. But I can tell you that the evidence that we have that Mark wrote the gospel and that he wrote what he remembered Peter saying is better than what we have for Plutarch. And Plutarch is largely, widely regarded as the greatest ancient biographer. Much of what we know from the ancient world comes from Plutarch. So that's really remarkable. Um, the second criterion is that the author chose the sources reliably, or used the sources reliably. So the, number one, the author chose the sources judiciously, Number two, the author used those sources reliably. Now, unfortunately, we don't have Peter around or uh, where we could compare what Peter said with what Mark says Peter said. So we have to use some indirect uh, logic here. Where we can check Mark on certain things, he comes out being correct. And how do we do this? Well, we find things like, like um, uh, Casper talked about some, some different criteria. 
the criteria of authenticity, like the criteria of multiple independent sources, the criterion of embarrassment. Um, I mentioned a few of these. So um, we can do this and we see, well, Josephus mentioned some things about Jesus and, and that Tacitus does. Marbar, Serapion, Lucian, these all check out with things that, that Mark says. Uh, John, uh, even though scholars debate on whether John knew of the Gospel of Mark, almost everyone agrees that he's independent of Mark. And the majority of scholars today, critical scholars, I'm not talking about devotional scholars, right? Scholars who are writing devotionals. I'm talking about critical scholars who assess the arguments and try to work through these issues. Folks like Casper, folks like myself, the majority of critical scholars, according to Craig Keener, who's written a historical commentary, a large one, on the Gospel of John, says the majority of scholars today, even though they reject the traditional authorship of John's Gospel, they still believe that John's Gospel was either written by a disciple of Jesus, perhaps a minor disciple, or that whoever the author was, that author's primary source was one of Jesus' disciples. So that makes John an independent source from Mark. And so stuff that we find in Mark and in John would be multiply attested, uh, independent. And there's stuff in Paul, who's independent of all the Gospels, perhaps wrote before all of them. And uh, he attests to some things that are in Mark. So there are things where Mark can be checked, he's usually correct. There's also something that's interesting, and that is where Matthew and Luke use Mark. Uh, we know that, as I agree with Casper, that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source. What's interesting here is when you see how Matthew and Luke use Mark, yes, they edit him, yes, they adapt him, but they stick very close to him. In fact, they stick closer to Mark than Plutarch sticks to his sources. If we take Plutarch and see where he tells the same source in multiple lives, like he tells the story of Caesar's assassination in four of his biographies. Um, he tells the story of the uh, Catalinarian conspiracy um, of, I, I think it was uh, 62 BC, that um, he tells that I think in seven stories, uh, seven different biographies. And when you compare how the same person, Plutarch, using the same sources, tells the same stories, the differences between those stories are greater than when we see Matthew and Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke quoting Mark. Why did they, and, and by the way, yes, they do adapt him. Of course, some of those adaptations, a lot of them is because they're taught to paraphrase in certain ways. In that sense, the God, Mark, or Matthew and Luke were not as skilled at writing as Plutarch because they stick so closely. Um, and when you read the ancient literature, other ancient literature outside the Gospels, and you see how they use their sources, you're not so much taken back by the differences in the Gospels, you're more impressed by the similarities. Because again, where we can test how Matthew and Luke use Mark as their source, they stay far closer to their source than Plutarch or Josephus or most others, ancient historians and biographers stay with their sources. Why do they do this? Perhaps it's because they respect Mark. And why would they respect Mark so much? Well, it would make sense if Mark was reporting what Jesus' leading apostle Peter had said. Third, third criterion is that we can verify numerous items reported. And uh, I'll go with those things that Casper said. I agree with those. I, I'd probably only add one thing to what he said, and he'd probably agree with this, is that uh, Jesus believed that he had a special relationship with God uh, who had chosen him to usher in his kingdom. I don't know if you, you think that, but that's regarded as historical by almost all historians of Jesus. And then that's a, I'm talking about nearly 100%, and then there are other items that many scholars, though not all, would, would grant. So through using things like the criteria of authenticity, mul uh, criteria of embarrassment, multiple independent sources, early sources, unsympathetic sources, we can learn a bunch of things about Jesus. Um, and then fourth criterion, only a very small percentage of the items reported in that piece of literature have a reasonable chance of being errors. Now, when we look at things in Mark, uh, there are a few candidates for errors in Mark. Um, there are a few things for candidates in, in, uh, for errors in Plutarch. Uh, there are lots of er known errors in Suetonius, even though he's regarded as one of the most accurate Roman biographers. But that thing and, uh, in Mark, 
Uh, in Mark chapter 2, he talks to, Mark mentions how David uh, took and his men took the consecrated bread from the uh, priest Abiathar uh, when it wasn't permitted. And, uh, but when you go to the Old Testament, it doesn't say that Abiathar was the high priest at that time. It says that his father, Ahimelech, was the high priest. So that's a possible error. There are three occasions where there's possibly Mark is geographically confused. Uh, but again, these are, these, are, these are all very minor items, and it, it would impact some of our uh, a doctrine of biblical inerrancy, but they, they would not impact uh, a doctrine of historic or a, a belief in the historical reliability of the Gospels. Um, certainly, there are far fewer items in the Gospel of Mark that are regarded as possible errors than we, we would find in Suetonius's Life of Augustus, which is his finest biography. So I think we're on good reason, given those four criteria and how the Gospels fulfill them, I think we're on good grounds for saying, uh, broadly speaking, uh, that the gospel, gospel of Mark is historically reliable. Now what about those things Casper said? Um, he, I only have a couple minutes for these, but he said, historical Jesus research produces very varied results. I agree with this, him on that. He said that there's no consensus, and in essence that cast out on the enterprise. Uh, but the, mostly I think the consensus is because of the disparity of horizons among historians. They have different world views. Um, so if, if you come from a naturalistic world view, well then of course you're going to say that the miracles in, Jesus, in, in the Gospels didn't occur. If God doesn't exist, if God doesn't act in the world, well then the miracles in the Gospels did not occur. But if you're open to those things, then you look at the evidence and you say, well, you weigh it. You say, is there good evidence that this occurred? Or if you expand your horizon and you say, look, I may not have experienced this, but there are a lot of testimonies from people around the world that they say that these mere miraculous things do occur. And a lot of these are bogus claims, but some of them turn out to be quite remarkable, quite uh, corroborated in that case. Well, you start to look at those and you expand out data past your own personal experience, and you say, well, maybe these things do happen. Maybe reality looks a little more like Narnia than atheists like to think. Um, so if we, I think it's the responsibility of the historian to put a check on their worldview when they come to something like the Gospels and say, all right, maybe I'm wrong on this. Let's just look at the text and let's see what the evidence is. And if the evidence points to things like miracles or the resurrection of Jesus, and your worldview doesn't allow it, well, maybe it's time to change your worldview. Um, there is a consensus that's absent from not only religious historical matters, but non-religious historical matters. Uh, I had a debate with uh, the prominent New Testament scholar, John Dominic Crossan, two weeks ago from today. And, um, you know, uh, I turned to the, uh, the moderator, who is a professor of ancient history. He's not a Christian, and his area of expertise is the late Roman Empire. It's collapsed, it's fallen apart. And he said that there are a lot of issues within that, non-religious issues for which there's no consensus. That doesn't mean that you can't prove things, or you should look down on the practice of history. Uh, there's a consensus absent with many scientific matters. Um, are some of the laws of science indefeasible, or are all the laws of science defeasible? Well, scientists disagree. Do we live in the only universe, or there, is there a multiverse? Well, scientists disagree. Global warming, if uh, most scientists agree that there's global warming, but they disagree on whether it's just part of the cycle of our Earth, or whether it's caused by, by humans. So, um, despite the, the existence of scientific method, uh, there's still no consensus on many issues within science, but we don't abandon scientific method. We just understand that there's often not going to be a consensus. Um, all right, Casper says he's a moderate pessimist. The uh, Gospel of Mark, he says, was written after 70. Yeah, it's interesting. This is a minority position he embraces here. Uh, within the last year, my son and all did this study. We found 76 sources written by critical scholars since 1965. Um, and of 76 sources, only five of them said, of critical scholars, only five said that Mark was written after 70. The majority of critical scholars writing on when Mark was written say it was written between the years 50 and 70 today. Um, now, specific of sayings, he says that there, 
um, are things that are reliable in the Gospels that he talked about, but what about those things that are unreliable? Jesus not being born in Bethlehem because uh, Mark doesn't mention it. Well, Suetonius doesn't mention where he was born. That doesn't mean that later reports of where he was born uh, in, and, uh, are, are false. Uh, he says uh, it, we, he didn't walk on water. He didn't raise, the uh, raise from the dead from a historian's viewpoint because historians cannot say he did so because things like that do not happen in the world. I disagree. I would say things like that do happen in the world. Um, um, Craig Keener's two volumes, massive two volumes, Miracles, he provides numerous instances of corroborated miracles uh, of things happening. I could give you several instances of uh, accounts of miracles that have happened in present day. And so if miracles happen today, that increases the likelihood that they happened in the past. In terms of Jesus rising from the dead, I think the historical evidence for that is profound. Um, I think it is absolutely the best historical explanation given the data that is even that data that's granted by virtually all scholars who study the subject. Um, let's see. Uh, he, let's see. He said he great commission. Well, I just want to like, get to um, I, I won't be able to cover everything just because. So let me just conclude. He said the Gospels were rewritten. Uh, that's like Midrash. Uh, uh, fiction, or as we say in the U.S., fake news. Um, that the Gospels were changed, they were rewritten to address different contexts, but I, I think a lot is more, more than is justified is made of the differences in the Gospels. The changes really are minor when you look at them. Even the last, Jesus' last words on the cross, um, you have Mark, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whereas in John, it's, I thirst. Uh, one, of the, one of the last words, that's because in Mark, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then his last word, it's just a yell. And, and John, it's I thirst, and then later, into your hands I commit your spirit, my spirit. But as Dan Wallace has pointed out, every time the word thirst is used, uh, like in the New Testament of, of Jesus, he's talking about thirsting after God's spirit, after God. It's a spiritual thing. So what John has done, again, is a theological paraphrase. He's taken, why have you forsaken me, God? And he's paraphrased that to bring out a deeper spiritual meaning. I thirst. I'm thirsting for you, God. It's the same kind of message. It's just different words. As Paul Anderson, a uh, prominent uh, Johannine scholar, says that John is a theological paraphrase. So is historical reliability of the Gospels important? Um, I, I think it is. And perhaps some of our discussion going forward uh, can focus on that. Thank you. Thank you, Casper and Mike, for your talks. Uh, we will now take a 10-minute break. Uh, so during the break, please drink some coffee and uh, 